Ladies and gentlemen, welcome after the break. I hope you're all full of energy after this lunch and uh, I'm going to introduce you our first speaker this afternoon. It's Miss Elena Jeleva. Good to have you in Warsaw. Uh, she's doing lots of great things. Uh, she's originally from Bulgaria, but she studied in Germany. And she works with corporations, startups, and public organizations in the region and helps to implement the design thinking methodology in their work. What is design thinking? You'll sure, surely soon to know. And uh, she's also leading the designthinking.bg, which is the first design thinking agency to the east from Warsaw. Give her a very warm applause. Elina Zaleva. Thank you for this excellent presentation. It's more than what I am. That's uh, how usually presenters are, you know, put into a cult. Um, so I'll speak about the first phase of design thinking, which is used research. How many of you know what used research is? Can you raise your hands? There are a few people, okay. How many people actually apply used research to your startups? A few less people, okay, that's usually the case. How many of you know what troublemaking is? You know, making troubles, being cheeky, I guess all of you know that. So, for those of you who don't know what used research is, don't worry, it's a lot like troublemaking, and I'll come to that in a minute. Let me first just say a few words of how I came at all to the topic of used research. So, as I was presented, I'm a design thinking coach and consultant. And design thinking, for those of you who might not know, is a methodology for developing innovative solutions. And I think it's because of the word innovative, innovation. A lot of people think that what I do has to do with tech, has to do with technology, which is not really the case because my work is very, very analog most of the time. For example, I spend a lot of hours teaching people how to talk to other people. It's funny, yeah? That's much about innovation. But I train basically companies and startups and even people from the public sector and NGOs how to talk to their users, how to lead interviews with their users. And through these conversations, we find important things like what are the different user profiles they can target, what are the different problems these user users have, what is the priority of these problems, what is the scale, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, for companies, knowing the problem is very, very important before they build the solution. You know, they don't want to put money into just building something, into just, you know, creating innovative solutions if they are not solving a problem. So this problem solving is the basis of used research. And these interviews, these conversations that I mentioned, they are the minimum form of used research you can have. Um, in design thinking we say, if you know the problem, if you know whose problem that is, you're halfway through the innovation process because what is left for you is to find through prototyping, through iterations, a solution that solves that problem. So I'll be speaking about this today. I'd like to advocate for used research. I'd like you as a startup to use the techniques that I'll mention at the end as early as possible in the process. And these are techniques for researching your user directly, having direct contact with your user. It's not to say that design thinking kind of says, all other research is not valid. On the contrary, everything you do as a marketing effort to get to know your users is perfectly fine. In design thinking, we're adding a new layer, basically, of researching your users through direct contact, interviews, observations, etc. So for today, I have really three topics. The first one is what are the consequences if you, as a startup, don't go through user research? What happens? The second one is what are the prejudices or why most startups don't want to do user research? What is the most common excuse and why is it not valid from my point of view? 
And the third one is, given that I have convinced you to use youth research, by the end of this presentation, I'd like to show you three very simple to use techniques. You can start using them very early in your startup, before you have started building something. That's very, very important. But most of them you can continue using throughout your product development. And that's basically important to design thinking, that you don't do use research just once in the beginning, but it's a continuous thing you do uh, as you develop the solution. Do we have a deal? You're very quiet. It's a deal. <laughs> it's a deal. So let me start with consequences. Before I come to what happens to those startups that don't do use research, let me tell you what I have observed. Basically, life happened so that I really did observe a lot of startups. I listened to lots of failure and success stories, etc., etc. What I have observed is that most startups plunge from an idea that they have for building something very quickly into building it. No use research, no nothing. Most startups that I know, and this is a painful fact for me, have never spoken to their users until the moment they have to sell them something. And depending on their business model, if it doesn't require direct sales, they never speak to their users. And that's a problem. Plunging into building without knowing what's waiting for you down there, what are the different user profiles, what are their pro problems, and for whom you choose to work, for which profile, for which problem you choose to work, is important. And it will kill you if you don't. This attitude, plunging very quickly from your idea into building it, leads to you falling in love with your idea. And I'll tell you why this is bad. It's bad because as you start building your idea, you start investing everything you have. You invest your time, the money you have, your co-founder's time, your co-founder's money, maybe somebody else's money. It doesn't matter. You invest all the resources available to you. And the more in you invest, the more you fall in love. And the more you fall in love, the more protective you become of your own idea. You become defensive of the deficiencies of your own ideas. So any feedback that somebody wants to give you, it's kind of half heard. You don't listen as attentively as you should be. And the problem with this is, this love leads you to producing failed products. And I'll explain why failure is bad in this case. I open a little bracket now. Failure is not bad by default. Failure is good, it could be very instructive, we can learn a lot from failing. The problem is that there is smart failure and dumb failure. And dumb failure is when you're failing at, you know, you're building something that solves nobody's problem. You're building something that you think is a good idea, which is a very soft way to say you're doing nothing. You're not solving anything. And this is dumb failure. Smart failure is when you know what's the problem, you care for it, and you're failing at building the right solution. That's smart. But dumb is what I just said. And I'll tell you what are the mechanics behind this love-failed relationship. The first you know, scenario that I have observed through my contacts with startups is, I call this the Swiss army knife syndrome. When you have this syndrome, you build very cluttered products, which means you had the idea, you started building it, you don't have a mental picture of who your user is, what is their top priority problem, and you're not building to solve that. You're just, you know, building something for multiple users for multiple problems. You're wasting your efforts, and your product looks like this. The problem with these products is that no user can identify with it. No user can say, oh, this is a problem, uh, this is a product, and it solves my problem. So cluttered products are failed products, they flop. The other scenario that I have observed, and I call this the tomato jar syndrome. The tomato jar syndrome, because all tomato jars look and feel and taste the same, is when you, when you have it, you build a very generic product. So how does this happen? This usually happens 
let's say when you and your co-founders have seen a product, a existing product, and you have said to yourself, guys, we can build this better. We can do this better. And I'm not saying, you know, this is the copycat type of scenario. And I'm not saying this is bad. Business, startups, it's all about execution. If you can build it better, if you can bring it to a different market, perfect. The problem is that in this scenario, what happens is you spend too much time studying the competitor's product, the original product from which you took the inspiration, then studying your users. So you're building something that's very close to the original product, something that looks and feels and tastes the same. So you're building a very generic product eventually. And users don't like this because they want something that talks to them. They want something that's differentiated. So these are the two scenarios that I have observed. And as I said, they all lead to failed products. So these are the consequences. Let me just say a few words about the prejudices or why startups totally skip this use research part. So the first excuse or prejudice I hear a lot is, why should we speak to users? They don't know what they want, right? And I very often hear the quote by Henry Ford, who is supposedly said, if I had asked people what they want, they would have said a faster horse, right? That's why I put a horse on the picture. And that's absolutely right. People, users, don't know what they want. Very often, they cannot express what they want. But user research is not crowdsourcing. You don't go to your users to ask them for ideas. You go there to understand fundamentally who they are, what are the different user profiles, what are their needs, what are the unresolved problems, what is the priority of these problems. And then you try to find a problem with high priority, with large scale. This is where you want to position your startup. So that much about Henry Ford and users don't know what they want. The other excuse I hear a lot is, it will slow us down. I mean, most startups that I know, especially the ones that are in an acceleration program, they have really so many things to do. And if you tell them, oh, guys, you, by the way, have to do use research as well, you have to go and speak to your users, this is like an additional thing. And it, you know, it feels like if we have to do this and all the other stuff, it will slow our launch. We will launch, you know, not at the time that we have planned for. And here I have to quote somebody else. It's one of the Google Venture partners. It's the partner for UX. And he was speaking recently at a conference like this one in front of a lot of startups. And he said to them, this was his message. If you guys want to launch your product, use research will slow you down. If you guys want to launch a great product, use research will speed you up. I got so inspired by this that I decided to name my presentation How Will Use Research Sp Speed You Up? So it's really up to you guys what you want to do. If you really want to launch what you have in mind, don't talk to your users. If you want to launch something that your users will love, use, recommend, come back to you, then please spend some time with them. And the last excuse I hear a lot is, we are not experts. And we are not experts is, again, I empathize with all these excuses. But we are not experts is not really a problem. Because there are studies that show that even you know, people in the team, let's say developers, that have you know, not, they, ha they haven't been trained to talk to people, right? Even if they engage in direct research methods, like interviewing, like usability tests, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they become better at what they do. There is a recent study which has been done with two controlled groups. The first one develops a web application according to a brief. The second one has the same brief but has access to the users. They interview them in the beginning, they do usability tests, etc., etc. The second group produces exponentially better 
UX on the web application. Exponentially better. That's, that's significant. So the only thing that I'd like to add here on we are not experts. Essentially, in interviewing, which is, as I said, the minimum form of user research you can have, there are two mistakes you can make. And as I mentioned them, you immediately will notice and you will avoid it. The first mistake you can make is basically talking too much, sale pitching, talking about your idea, about your product. Because the purpose of user research, as I said, is to learn about the user. It's not to sell your idea. So this is the first mistake you can make. The second is you can listen too little, which is essentially the same. You're either talking or not listening. And I'd like to give you now three techniques that kind of you know, avoid making these mistakes. These are techniques that you can use in the very early stages of your startup, but depending on what your startup is, you can keep on using them as you move forward. And because I have noticed that most startups, most co-founders don't really like talking to people. I've chosen techniques that are suitable for the also mildly introverted people. So really anybody can do them. Let me start with the first one. It's called the stealth interview. Stealth interview basically absorbs all the risks of a normal interview, where I said you might either pitch too much or listen too little. In a stealth interview, you're not allowed to speak about your startup. So you're in stealth mode. You're just having a conversation with the other person without mentioning what you're working on. And I'll give you an example. Otherwise, it's too abstract. So imagine, do you all know what carpooling is? I see a lot of faces noting. OK. So imagine you want to build a carpooling application for Eastern Europe or something. And you're at a conference like this. And somebody comes to speak to you, as it happens a lot at conferences. It's the perfect opportunity to interview, to interrogate, if you want, this person without telling him about your plans. So you can ask, how did you arrive at this conference? What means of transportation did you use? Why? I mean, do you know about carpooling? What do you think? You can basically get information about if the person has awareness for this, if he has prejudices against carpooling, it might, it might be the case. And then you know, you know, you have an indication of where your problems or where the hurdles might be on the way. So this is one. Is it clear? OK, I see faces nodding. The other one that is also very easy to use, it's called the user diary. So this is a technique in which you outsource all the work to your users, basically. All you have to do, and this is a very good approach for everything that has to do with behavioral um, apps, healthcare, medicine. If you're in that business, this is a very good tool. User diaries, basically, you recruit a few users. If you're in the very early stages, this could be you know, friends and families. If you're in more you know, advanced stages, then you have to be very selective of whom you invite to, to do this. But essentially, the whole purpose is that they keep a diary of an activity and send you the information on a regular basis. Let me give you one example. Let's say you want to build a fitness app. Some, you know, some sort of fitness app that supports people in you know, becoming more fit. What you can do is you recruit a few people and you ask them, every day, make a little plan of all the healthy, sporty things you want to do. And as the day goes by, just you know, report on what you have done or what you haven't done. Because all we know that sometimes we make more plans that we actually you know, uh, perform and ask them to write how it made them feel, why. You will very quickly, in a week, if you have 10 users doing this for you, you will have a lot of information to look through. As you have this information, what do you have to do? You have to look for patterns. What are the different user profiles? What are the problems associated with these profiles? What is the priority of these problems? It will immediately give you an indication where can you be useful as a startup? Where can you build something that solves a problem? The 
just something that I remembered about user diaries. There is even an app about user diaries so that can help you facilitate this process. It's called Experience Fellow and you can basically subscribe your users in the app and they immediately report inside, taking photographs, recording videos, anything you need. It's very, very easy to use. And the last one is fly on the wall. Fly on the wall is exactly what it is. You are the fly on the wall and you observe what happens. It's an observation technique. In design thinking and user research, we talk a lot about direct research techniques. I mentioned this in the beginning, I'm repeating it because I see new people coming in. So fly on the wall works like this. Imagine you are um, a B2B startup. You, it's, it's especially good for B2B startups. I mean, usually in B2B you have to be aware of the industry, at least you as the main founder. It's better if you have had previous experience, but maybe it's not the case for all the people that you recruit, all the developers, for example. So it makes a lot of sense. Let's say you want to build an inventory management app. Let's say you want to help warehouses, you know, organize their stock or keep track of their stock. What makes sense here is to just call a few warehouses and say, guys, can we come and observe your work? We, we want to build tools that will help you. And you send your developers to two, three warehouses for a day, half a day, as, as long as you can afford, to observe who does what, what takes the longest, what is the most common mistake, why, how do people cover up for it? In, remember, all the time in news research, you're looking for several things. Problem is the most important, the user profile associated with that problem, and additionally, you need to know what is the priority of this problem. Is it really a painful problem? Is it a problem of large scale? You as a startup, you want to be there. This is where you can build something of use. This is where you can build something that scales. So fly on the wall, very, very easy to use. And I'd like to you know, conclude with basically reminding you what user research gives you. You remember in the beginning we talked about cluttered products. User research gives you focus because you get to know directly your users and you know, I'm working for this profile. You cannot build a solution for everybody. And this, you know, I guess if you are in, in startup, you should know this. You're building for a specific profile. You're solving a specific problem. And this focus makes you build the right things first and makes you move quicker through the process. The other thing that user research gives you is differentiation. Because you know exactly for which user profile or user profiles, it might be sometimes more than one, you're working on. You know for whom you're building your solution. And it, it doesn't look and feel like other similar solutions. It feels like a solution for that person. It's different, it's differentiated, and people can immediately see this. So this is what it gives you. No more cluttered products, no more generic products. I remind you again, the secret of user research is not just the information you get, it's also the chance that you can practice empathy. Empathy means through this direct contact with the people, you understand them firsthand, you understand their problems firsthand. And that's very, very important because you develop empathy. Empathy makes your ideas more adequate. It makes your, um, basically, resources, the use of your resources more channeled. That's very, very important to a startup that has limited resources. So my message for you is, if you are in love with your idea, please do go and speak to your users, start the conversation, and I hope you fall in love with them. This is what will help you build products that they will love. Thank you. I don't know if we have time for Q&A, I don't remember. It's your turn.
So would you recommend it, for example, instead of other interviewing techniques? So, right. So I will repeat the question so that everybody hears it. Is user diary better technique than other techniques? The thing is that there is no better or best technique. What normally you want to do in youth research is there is something that's called the triangle of youth research. You want to have some interviews. So you want to hear some stories directly from the users. But also you want to have some observation techniques, which will give you a totally different perspective. Because people will not tell you everything during an interview. Whether it's a focus group, whether it's a one-to-one, -one, they won't tell you everything. A lot of things you will catch as problems through observations. And the third you know, side of the triangle is self-exploration, that you get into the shoes of the customer. You try for yourself, what does it mean to be, you know, my user? So user diaries is kind of a virtually getting into the shoes of the customer, if you want. But I wouldn't say that it's better than all the others. If you have the chance, ideally, perfectly, you should have a bit of everything. You should have some interviews, you should have some observations, for example, some usability testing. Usability testing is what? It's observation with a prototype. And you should have some self-exploration. Does that answer your question? Yeah, somehow. So in general, you recommend just to use every aspect, every, every technique you mentioned? I would recommend a combination, yes, absolutely. So. These three that I chose are very easy and very, how to say, um, you can present them in very limited time. And I know that by using them, you can not do any harm to your startup. For example, interviewing is, you have to spend more time on it, proper interviewing, like one-to-one -one or focus groups. So this was just a selection. If you want to find more, uh, more techniques I recommend, for example, one good online source is Google F Venture Research Library. It's an online open library about all sorts of used research techniques. You will find a lot of information, including, for example, how to recruit these users and whom should you interview, whom should you invite to interviews or usability tests or any other test. That's very, very important as well. Hi, uh, you mentioned the uh, experience fellow app. What are other tools that you could recommend that are useful for design thinking? For design thinking, well, it really depends for which phase. I mean, for prototyping, there are different tools. For use research, there are different tools. Uh, tools for the whole um, process. My favorite tool so for it. Say three best tools you know. You mean online tools? Okay, so Experience Fellow is definitely a good tool. I've tested their alpha version. If I remember correctly, they are now in their beta version, right? Okay. So another good tool are all the tools of the type, let's say, building all sorts of landing pages or web pages in a very easy way, like Strikingly, for example, or Squarespace. Because especially if you are in the business of Web applications, a very easy way to test something is to just build it on the surface, you know, not a full-blown website, but even sometimes a landing page is, is a good test to, you know, to feel where you should be going. So all of these are good. And the other one is Pop App. Pop App is an app that makes you test applications, mobile applications. You can make a very quick prototype of your application without even a line of coding. So basically you draw it by hand or um, you know there are tools to, to draw like iPhone apps. You make photographs, you connect them and you create a little user experience for people to test. That's your, you can really do it in half an hour. So in design thinking we like to use tools that very quickly can allow us to make a little experiment, to test something very quickly without building it. That's the whole principle of design thinking. 
More questions? <clears throat> How do you respond to the accusation that um, design thinking really um, shows you a very small perspective of the market because you test only one, two, or just few people? You, you don't test it on the mass scale like the research institutes, etc. So there are. Um I have two answers for you, basically. The first one is I never ever looked at design thinking as a separate way of doing things. As I mentioned in the beginning, it's a layer on top of what you already do. So how I approach every project that I work on, I read all the possible research there is. I mean, quantitative research is very good because it gives you a direction of where you know, you might be looking for problems. Where is the scale? So quantitative research is very, very good. Design thinking adds a layer. That is, you, you basically touch and feel your users, and that's very, very important. Um, so this is one. The other one is, basically, you have to feel comfortable with your own instrument. So if the team doesn't feel comfortable with this, then they shouldn't be using it. So I'm not insisting that everybody should use design thinking, that everybody should do this. If they are, if they are unconvertible to this way of thinking, it's better not. I, I don't know if this is not in contra it's not controversial to what I just presented, but honestly, you have to be prepared to ride the horse you're riding. You have to be very careful. You have to be aware of the whole process, how to interpret certain data. It's not just ticking the box. Ah, design thinking says we should be interviewing people. Let's go and interview people. Uh, but if you don't know how to interpret the data, if you don't know what are the, the, the problems you might fall, that, that's dangerous. Um, in terms of usability testing specifically, which is, which is a subset of use research. There are results, um, not, not results, but there are results from research that if you test 12 people of the same category, after the 12th person you get repetitive results. So it's not just about the quantity, sometimes, and for usability tests that's usually the case. 12 people you get, you get the trend, you get uh, you get what you need. You don't need 100 people to test it, or 1,000. Does that answer? Okay. Hi, uh, I have a question. Uh, do you uh, recommend involving your whole team uh, in the process of user research, or just picking uh, one or two people and then uh, just presenting the results to the others? Like all the others, this is also a very, very good and valid question. So it really depends. Let's say if you are a small team, up to four or five people, I highly recommend that everybody is involved. If you are a more advanced startup, let's say you're in the 50th employee, or is this the case? Yeah, no. <laughs> you cannot just send everybody to talk to their users. Um, so maybe you can have a little research team that everybody trusts and that translates this to the other people. Eventually you can have like user days or whatever where people that are not um, in the user research team can spend some time with users and can validate their own, I don't know, just, just for the taste and feel of the user. But you cannot afford as a company, even, even you know, as a 50 employees company, to send everybody and do user research. The problem with this, little use research team is that it really has to be trusted team. Because I have this um, example from a company that says, we uh, assigned three people to do use research and they're manipulating the direction we as a startup are taking. So you have to, to have trust between people because as a company, you might have different ideas in which direction you want to go. And I mean, it's very easy for the team to say, yeah, but this is what the user wants, so let's go in that direction. And you have to have means inside the company to validate that. Can you bring the mic yeah, here? Next question. Um, you are saying that like, you should look for your users actually to test uh, this, uh, let's say, software. But uh, 
did you happen to see a difference, for example, between your users, uh, when the platform, for example, is already on, be between uh, how your users respond to uh, your research, between the people, for example, that are not actually your users, but are more high tech and can provide even more advanced view, but they haven't been using your platform for a while, so they don't have uh, as good experience. Can you see a difference between those and uh, what uh, target group to test uh, would be better for your platform? So essentially, the first iteration of use research you do, the very first, before you have started building your product, if you do things properly, okay? In that iteration, you interview and you research as wide as possible. So you imagine this is my profile and you go to speak to your profile of users. But just for the sake of inspiration, for you know, opening up a little bit your, your, your vision, you go and you test with, uh, we call them extreme users or the hyper tech users if you want, or with non-users, people that will never ever you know, come uh, to, to the idea to use what you're building. So the first iteration is as wide as possible. The second one is you already maybe have an idea, aha, huh, this is clearly the problem and this is the one or two profiles that stay behind it. And from there on, I recommend that you test only with the people you're building for, not anybody else, because th they're not valid anymore. You tested in the beginning or you researched in the beginning with many different people just to get ideas. As you proceed, you test with your own users. For example, what usually happens is you have the first version, alpha or beta, whatever, and then you test with these people. Or you select some of them that you think are not too early adopters, but are normal you know, users. Do you understand what I mean? Okay. More questions? If so, please raise your hand. Okay, so the last one is from me. Okay. Uh, because you help your customers to, to do better in research, what's the most important difficulty? Uh, what's the most important area that you help them with? Um, what do they do wrong? What do they do wrong? <laughs> What do they do wrong? One of the things that really is, does, does not come across very well is the first excuse that I mentioned. Why should we at all speak to these users? Especially hardcore developers, no offense uh, to anybody, are like, Ellie, you don't understand. We started our own startup, our own venture, because we want to build things. We want to be entrepreneurs who build stuff. And I'm like, okay, guys, but use research does not prevent you from building. You can actually build some more if you speak to your users because they will give you feedback constantly. So this is my, my most, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, huh? but most powerful argument, if you are really up for building stuff, just go and talk to the users. You will build some more, I promise you. You will have to do some more A-B testing, more you know, versions, more prototypes. So this is, I think, the biggest problem, especially in IT companies, especially in companies run by um, tech people, by developers. So it's the approach, it's their mentality. Yes, 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 they want to build things, <laughs> which is good. I mean, that's why you become a startup. That's why you want to be independent. You want to, to show what you can, and they can build great technology. But the problem is product technology is nothing without you know, the perception of the user. Um, it was, what was the name of the founder of YC? The name just flipped. You know YC, Y Combinator? The founder said, you know, it's not about the product, it's the experience of the user with the product. So you have to know these people, if, even if they don't know what they want. That's not a reason to ignore them, you know. Okay, great. Thank you. Big applause for Alina.